All right, so emergency communications. It takes many, many forms. I'm gonna try and cover them at an extremely high level. If you want a deeper dive on any of these topics, I have cards up front that go to my YouTube channel. I have over a thousand videos on YouTube that talk on emergency communication among just enjoying amateur radio and the different radio hobbies. So we're gonna try and talk about what is emergency communication from a high level, effectiveness of radio, this is largely wireless technologies we're talking about, the radio services that the FCC acknowledges, FCC being the United States governing body, if you will, but other countries have their own governing bodies, the value of ham radio, PACE plans, which PACE plans is where we get into kind of the nitty gritty of what you all should start thinking about how to layer your communications approach, what to do during an emergency, and then we'll talk a little bit about the ad advanced training groups that exist that you can join as volunteers. All right, so what is MCOM? So our communications can break down. Um, how many of you have been in a situation where cell phones don't work? Hands, uh, pretty much everybody has been through a situation where either they're completely dead, uh, either voice doesn't work, or you can only do text messages, right? or some smattering of that, this, that, and the other. Or you put yourself in a situation where you have no signal, right? Where you're in the wilderness, you have placed yourself in a situation on purpose, maybe you're off-roading in a group, maybe you're hiking, maybe you're doing whatever, and you just, you don't have signal anymore. So some of these systems that we're gonna talk about, services, radio services, are what you would potentially use in a situation of not just emergency, uh, but maybe letting your family know you're okay. The same concepts apply. Personally, um, I love my phone. I love everything I can do on it, but at the same time, I like to have a layered system for handling what could happen. Also, that's one of my favorite, uh, favorite things that, that's been happening a lot recently. Is anybody fooled by this? Who, who, who is, uh, who's trying, who's this for? Is this for the trees or is this for us? I don't, I don't know. But we get a lot of those in California and it, it cracks me up every time I see them. I'm driving up to my dad's in Big Bear at 6,400 feet and I'm, I'm about to go up the hill and there's just a big palm tree, like a steel palm tree with all this stuff hanging off of it. And everything is, is like an evergreen at that point and up. It's like, where'd this palm tree come from? And it's got these antennas coming off of it. Hilarious. What? Yeah, no, these are, that's a real. No, that's a cell phone. There's cell phone towers. They make look like trees. Make, try to look like trees. It's, it's, it's really funny. Right, I'm sure we pay a ton. Yeah, 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 I'm sure. Why? It, 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 come talk to me after and see if you can explain how that logic works out. All right, so what is, uh, what is MCOM is gonna be a, a section we're going through. So continuing this a bit, field expedient communications is our goal. For example, oh man, it's really dark in here. I appreciate we can't make this any brighter, but what you're, you're kind of seeing, kind of not seeing, that's a gator case. It's a pull, by, pull behind gator case with a handle, much like you'd see a rollerboard suitcase. Inside of it, I have a amateur radio high frequency station. That's the stuff that goes really long distance and a VHF UHF station that is in for like in close communication, line of sight stuff. Uh, the antenna is this, one of the sides of the antenna is right there. Whole thing runs off of solar, which the panel's right there, which is the Jackery panel. And then I've got a laptop that charges off of this system as well. Field expedient in this case is from my trunk to the park bench. That's the field expedient. Uh, this is far more high speed, low drag as I like to say. This guy right here goes in a pack. I can carry that wherever. Dave is nicely letting me borrow his. Um, I have the same radio at home though. Put that in a backpack, you can hike miles with it. And I've literally run it up. Here is a just a what we call a roll-up antenna, and we're working fine. We're connected, listening to a local repeater here. So the goal in emergency communications is obvious, or is, is attempting to reestablish reliable point-to-point -point communication. That can be point-to-point -point communication with us to another ham that is coordinating with first responders. That could be us 
in communicating to our communities, our groups, people that like-minded individuals that want to work together during an emergency, and just our neighborhoods, right? There's a lot of people, neighborhood watch, CERT members, anybody? Hands up, nobody? No neighborhood watch, no CERT? No one, you guys have that out here? No neighborhood watch? That's okay, okay, all right. Maybe it's because uh, literally I can, I can just throw a, a rock out my window and I hit the, the house next to me. Probably more where that is. But you know, we've got, we've got elderly folks that are in our neighborhood that we try and look out for, uh, try and understand some of their medical conditions like oxygen generators, right? They need to fill up their oxygen bottles. If you're off grid or you lose power, what are you gonna need? You're gonna need a generator to make that work. You may get to a point where gas starts to get scarce. You may need to get on the radio to call for help. That kind of idea. All right, so what do we transmit? Generally, all the instances where radios are used during an emergency, we are trying to pass some kind of information, either the location of where I'm at or where I will be or where I plan to be at a certain amount of time with a given time that I plan on getting there so that if I don't arrive, hey, I may be in trouble. Health and status, meaning I am, I'm still okay, I got to the destination, but if you don't hear back from me in two days by 6 p.m., send the cavalry to help me out. Uh, weather, you guys have Skywarn, anybody Skywarn here, Skywarn? Really important group, by the way, thanks for what you do, it's, it's, it's important to put that information out there. Skywarn uses radio communication a lot because it's often sometimes faster depending on the situation of getting it to where it needs to go. And then just the status of current events, local logistics. Uh, these radios are both, again, keyed up to a local repeater. A local repeater is like a, like a hilltop party line. As long as my little radio can talk to that repeater, everybody that is within range, line of sight range, can hear the conversation going on. You often get news fastest if you're going just straight point to point instead of, say, listening to your AM, FM broadcast radio, because the bulletins you get out of here have to filter down from first responders and potentially through the government. Um, requesting supplies and relief, I kind of already mentioned the simple example of, hey, I need gas, I need to charge this person's uh, CO2 charger, and then relaying for first responders. And, and there was a good clarification point yesterday. We had somebody that was actually first responder dis 911 dispatch, and they were mentioning that they don't listen to amateur radio frequencies or FRS frequencies or GMRS frequencies. So in emergency situations, if you're operating with a preparedness group, a first responder group, you are a ham that is adjacent to dispatchers. You literally pass messages, either physical or via the computer, to those individuals to let them know what's going on in the cases that people do that. Why do we use it? Uh, easy point-to-point -point communication. When you're in the field, you're off-roading, you're hiking, it's as simple as... If you're an amateur radio operator to have a Baofeng type radio or a Walmart type FRS radio, assuming you're in range. I cannot understate the importance of range and understanding what these are as far as line of sight communicators. I'll explain what that means in a little bit. These devices are completely under your control, meaning I don't pay AT&T or Verizon to use this. I don't pay them to use the airwaves. Once I buy the radio, potentially earn, uh, get my license, pay for a license in the case of GMRS, I control it. It's under my control. I don't owe anybody anything. And further, if AT&T goes offline, um, I can still operate. Anybody following the news out of Canada right now? Rogers, the telecom company? They have, uh, I think I was told last night, they have 13 million people that are subscribed under their services and they just all went offline last night. While we were all here doing our thing with our cell phones, they just stopped having communication capability. So, not good. No services, easy to fix, modify. Generally, these are a little bit easier to work on, particularly replace antennas and batteries than it is your cell phone. How many of you have opened up a cell phone to replace the battery? No, we just, we th okay, one, good for you. But, a lot of people just get a new one. <laughs> These take double A's in some cases, or just lithium ion rechargeables. It's ad hoc by nature, meaning emergency communication with radios, wireless technology is ad hoc. We can establish a base station quickly, pretty much as you're seeing right here, as long as I'm providing power to this unit, I'm communicating. So long as this antenna is able to hear the people that I'm trying to communicate with. 
And because of that, it's easy to loosely monitor frequencies and keep an understanding of what's going on. These radios all have the capability to scan through channels. Again, local repeaters, local simplex channels, we can listen on them, scan through them anytime we like to hear if something happens or changes in an emergency type environment. So what is a radio? Uh, in, in simplest terms, the, the term I like to use is, I call this a magic box, magic black box. When we push down this button, it is transmitting energy. I can impart information on that energy based off of the different components in this magic box. In this case, this magic box has a microphone and a speaker. So I'm encoding and modulating is the right term. I'm modulating my voice onto the energy that's being sent out. That energy is radio waves, radio frequency. This radio is very simple. This radio can do voice modulation. It can do digital modulation, much like you do a computer, wireless communication. You can do Morse code, a traditional form of communication, but still highly effective. But at the end of the day, we're just imparting information onto that energy. That energy is getting picked up by another box, demodulated into its whatever appropriate part was, in this case, voice, and sent out its own speaker. That's the way to look at it. I find that's the easiest way to understand. That energy that comes out of the antenna is oscillating. That's why when we say we're operating on a certain frequency, that is the oscillation of the wave, one cycle of that oscillation. I use an analogy of a slinky to impart this information. If you have taken your slinky and you stretch it really far apart, and so you've got one peak and then a valley and a peak, and it's way stretched out, that's a low frequency oscillation. If I take that slinky and I slam it together and they're really tightly packed, extremely high frequency oscillation. So when I show you this, keep the slinky concept in mind. I'm gonna use an uh, antenna as a pointer. So at the end of the day, uh, everything I'm talking about as far as radio waves is concerned belongs to the electromagnetic spectrum. X-rays, ultraviolet, visible light, infrared light is all just high frequency oscillation of energy. As you slide down a little bit, this orange box is radio waves. It all exists in the same space. It's just a different oscillation of energy. That can be zoomed in on. When you zoom in on it, you see things low frequency, which is roughly 10 kilohertz down to zero-ish kilohertz. And then it goes all the way up just on this example of 100 gigahertz, which we actually go higher than. So again, slinky, far, far, far stretched out down here and then tightly, tightly packed here, high frequency. About right here at the 10 megahertz-ish border, everything that's high frequency punches through the atmosphere. The signals that come out at anything over 10 megahertz goes straight through the atmosphere into space. We use those frequencies to communicate with satellites, right? That's primarily what we use, often to the points of the very high gigahertz space where we can send lots of data. But everything lower than that, and this is advantageous for a lot of what we want to do, everything lower than 10 megahertz, we have a capability of bouncing our energy off of the atmosphere and bringing it back to Earth. So we get beyond line of sight capability. But we must have a radio that can operate in these frequency spaces. A Baofeng, for instance, which hopefully most of you know what this is. A Baofeng, <laughs> bad pointer in this case, a Baofeng operates around here and here, meaning I can use this to talk to the radio on the International Space Station, and there is a radio on the International Space Station, but I can't use it to talk to my brother two states over. The signals don't bend around the atmosphere, so you have to keep that in mind with whatever your goals are. A lot of people ask me, Josh, I want to have a solution to talk to my family members and they're like 400 miles away from me, just in a big circle. Buying a bunch of Baofengs is not gonna do it. If you want a true off-grid solution and you wanna use radio, you have to step into the higher frequency side of where we're at. Likely amateur radio to do that. Okay, that was probably the last high science-ish stuff I have to talk about. Now we're just gonna talk about the application of it. 
So the FCC acknowledges a couple of different radio services. They call them services, that means lots of things, but in the simplest terms, they're the type of radios you can buy and use. Family radio service is FRS. These are the radios you get at Walmart, like this one, a couple of bucks. It's like a blister pack. You get two of them for 30 bucks, something along those lines. Everybody asks me, what is the range on these? How far can we transmit? Hypothetically, if you're in space, it's all the way to space because it's just line of sight. I just turn it sideways and start talking at you. Realistically though, as human beings, we exist on the surface. And so all of these, all these great things called trees out here and hills attenuate your signal, they absorb it and prevent you from getting a direct communication to your intended party. So it depends is the answer, like most things. Ideally, you can get up to a mile depending on terrain, depending on what you have between you. But if you can see the summit, summit's probably the wrong word out here, but um, if you can see the top of the hill and they can see you, you probably can hit them. If you're just on the ground at the same level together, probably not. So the, always, the, 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 tell, the old ad adage is there's no replacement for elevation in this case. So if you get your antennas up with VHF, UHF radios, and use FRS radios like this, that signal is better when it's up high. Okay, so if you pick up Walmart radios, keep that in mind. All right, GMRS radios. Ground mobile radio service is just the big brother of FRS. They're slightly more powerful. They operate in the same frequency space, which is right about here. Both of these radio types, FRS and GMRS, operate in the UHF frequency space. Higher frequency, can get attenuated in um, greenery out here. Not the best for long distance, but very effective if you're in close. A lot of people are familiar with CB, Citizens Band. That is, go back here a second. That's right at this mark here. Uh, let me go up. Where are we at? Where am I? There we go. We're right around here with, uh, with CB. And so it can occasionally get skipped, which is what we're looking for in that case. And that is what gives you that extra propagation. Most of the time though, CB is for in-close communication as well. CB is limited to five watts usually, and the transmitters are what's licensed. All of these radios I've mentioned so far, you buy the radio, the radio taint has the license, it's been approved by the FCC, you can pick it up, use it, whatever. Don't have to worry about it, except for GMRS. But in that case, it's really just to cover your family. GMRS is a good solution for a lot of folks because it's a one-time fee for 10 years, $35, and it covers you, your significant other, your children, and your parents for a GMRS license, which is pretty nice. GMRS has the added advantage of, oh man, we're gonna have to be, <laughs> I didn't realize they were setting up tattoos. <laughs> no, man, I had no idea. I just looked over and was like, wow, okay. Um, I'll just work through it, it's good. <laughs> so uh, we're gonna find out what the uh, frequency oscillation is of a tattoo gun with, with my radio here with the, with the screen on it. It's gonna be interesting, a little bit of science. <laughs> so I, go ahead, go ahead. I'll answer you. I'll answer you in the most uh, YouTube approved way I can. So I don't get myself in trouble on YouTube. The, in the eyes of the law, no. You can buy, well as America, you can buy whatever you want, uh, but you, you can't transmit without a license. The reality is, is that I would assume most people that buy GMRS radios are transmitting without a license. That's what they're doing. Right. So. I know it happens. The FCC's not coming to anybody's door to take their radios away or, or lock them up because they have no money. They, they used to, decades ago, have a, a, a group of people that would do this, that would actually do investigations and, and pursue folks. They still have those groups, but their budget is so tiny now that they really only go after people that like uh, affect first responders, uh, private radio services, people that are paying the FCC. 
GMRS, they don't really care about. Ham radio, they don't really care about that much either. So keep that in mind. Uh, at the same time, I will mention, we had an individual uh, two weekends ago, two weeks ago, we found out about it. We believe he was using a Baofeng, believe, but I, don't quote me on that, allegedly. He transmitted eight times, the investigation found out eight times, trying to direct a uh, water dumping helicopter to where he thought the fire should be put out first, which happened to be where his radio equipment was that he was trying to protect. Uh, they didn't like that. The FCC showed up and they fined him $35,000. So are they coming after you for, for <laughs> illegally using your GMRS radio? No. If you actively get in the way of first responders, you better believe you're going to get a knock on your door, particularly if they find out where you're at, which can be tough too. So keep that in mind. Uh, GMRS, the other advantage is you can step up to 50 watt radios, which will get you much further. Put those in your car, get a nice antenna on the roof. You're going to do a lot better with that, particularly, again, I have to factor things. I'm, I'm in an area where I don't have trees where I'm from. California is basically desert, um, at least where I'm at in Southern California. So trees really do absorb RF. And you've got rolling hills that can affect RF when you come over the top of a hill and your buddy's on the other side. That will affect how far you get. But 50 watts output is what you want. Oh, I skipped ham radio. And then lastly, amateur radio. The advantage of amateur radio is that we've got access throughout this whole space. We've got band access all the way down in the low side and all the way up into the really high side. It's broken up into tiny slivers we call bands. So we pick the radio that we want to use based off of our goals. Super long distance or in close. Um, I kind of already mentioned other services depend on license acceptance by the FCC. It's person licensed for, the, for ham radio. We can skip that. These are those slices I mentioned. This is the amateur radio band plan. Most uh, technicians, technicians is the first level of amateur radio licensing. You get access to six meters, two meters, pretty much everything up into the high frequency space. Most effective two bands that most hams use is two meters and 70 centimeters. That's what the Baofeng runs on. If you step up to general, then you get access to all the bands, but you are restricted to portions of it. General is generally what I recommend most people go to if they're planning to become amateur radio operators. It gives you all the latitude to use any frequencies that we have within our radio service here in the United States. One note for technicians, you do get portions of uh, 10 meters as well for voice. You do get some of 40 and 80 as well, uh, I think another band, but that is limited to Morse code only, which is kind of a vestige of the way they used to do licensing. I still really like Morse code and it has a ton of value, but I, does anybody know Morse code here? Two people, all right. Kind of, so we can talk to each other in an emergency. <laughs> so if you want to talk in an emergency, you're probably not using Morse code. Yeah, right. Okay, so planning for emergencies. So this give, kind of gave you a top level, hopefully, idea of what's going on, hopefully. So what do we do to plan? Remember the goals that we're trying to achieve. Cell phone, gone. Internet, gone. Or you just are no longer in the sphere of being able to use your convenience communication tools, right? So you want to reunite with loved ones or let them know that you're okay. You want to establish communications for different groups, right? So you have a group at Camp A and their hike, another group's hike into Camp B, totally not within cell phone reception, different elevations, potentially different terrain in between you. That's where you'd want some type of emergency communications or ad hoc communication systems. If needed to call out for assistance from further away, what I mean specifically is you get hurt or you stumble upon someone who is hurt when you're hiking, and again, you are outside a cell phone range. That is an emergency in a traditional sense. This is when radio can help you and has helped. And allow you to coordinate with others for the information exchange to support requests. So this could be first responder coordination, again, passing notes, whether that's physical, word of mouth, or using some kind of online system, um, or just trying to coordinate with your neighbors in the event of an emergency. All right. Who has heard of PACE planning? PACE, all right. 
It is a term that I learned uh, from Mike Glover from Fieldcraft Survival. It is used in the military, special forces, it was the first, one, the first time I heard about it. The concept is a layered approach to communications. And it's, you work from the top down. Starts out at primary, which is the root, or the routine and most effective method of communication. The one everybody's familiar with and can use. This is your primary. If the primary stops working for some reason or is degraded and you want an extra layer of communication to support the message you're trying to get out, then you have an alternate type of communication or an alternate method. It doesn't mean I'm going to try voice and then when that doesn't work, I'm going to send a text message. No, the, the system is the primary, the whole system. So a alternate could be your family radio, your FRS radio, your GMRS radio. A and that's a, that's a common use, simple to use, PTT, talk, 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 easy. It either works or it doesn't work. Efficient, but you know, something you'd come to as a second resort. Contingency is a method that is not as convenient. Something that could be efficient, but not necessarily something you'd pull out all the time. There is an alternate or contingency, contingency specific uh, method of communication right here on this table, and it's this wire that I strung up. Not very effective in, or efficient in the sense that I had to walk over, grab a ladder, figure out where I was going to hang that thing, set it up, put it up, and now I can communicate. If I needed it though, and it was one of my last steps on my list, that would be the one I would go to if the other two couldn't make communication. And then the emergency is your last resort, the step that you go to. All things have failed. I couldn't communicate here. I couldn't communicate here. My cell phone's dead, out of batteries, whatever. I'm in the middle of nowhere, and that'd be the last step. So if you, if you think about a PACE plan, and you put those letters down on paper, and you go around your house, and you're like, what do I have? You may only have a P and an A, right? So that's the idea here is that start looking at what you have at home and what you could possibly add to help round things out. Now, mostly PACE implies you're transmitting, but I, I will mention for most emergency situations, for most people, it's pretty vital that you have just a simple AM, FM radio, something that's easy to cart around, easy to charge. This one runs off of USB-C. Uh, AM, FM is valuable, particularly shortwave too. I'll add shortwave to the mix because you're just using this as an information gathering tool. If you have no signal, no cell phone, no whatever, it's still RF, it still sends wherever, you can still receive it with simple radios. I'd put this as a primary. So in this example, you bump in the night, you wake up, power's out, cell phone's degraded or not working at all, what's the first thing you do? Well, probably get a flashlight, put your shoes on, that kind of thing. Um, but I'd pull out a radio, an AM, FM radio, start scanning to see what's going on. If it's still playing top 40, it's probably a local problem. You're probably good. If you're hearing buzzers and alarms, then then you're likely in a situation where <laughs> it's really loud. Uh, you're likely in a situation where you could be facing an emergency. Is your cell phone working is another primary, but we already covered that's probably not working. And have you coordinated with neighbors in this point? So AM FM radio gives an alarm, there's no information. By the way, this is like super doomsday stuff. This is really hypothetical. I don't see any of this happening, but I'm using it as an example. So cell phone doesn't work. AM, FM radio, garbage, let's say it's just an emergency tone. So now you pick up your FRS radios and try to talk to your neighbors. Hopefully you've coordinated with them and say, hey, in an emergency, turn on your radios and go to channel three, right? Okay, cool, we'll use channel three. Contingency is, do you have your radio license, GMRS? Do you have ham radio? If you have ham radio, then you can utilize the repeaters in our area right here to talk on and say, hey, What's going on? Does everybody else have the same problem I'm having? Is everybody okay? Anybody hurt? I heard a loud boom and it woke me up. Did anybody know what happened? So that's what you'd use in that case. And then emergency, maybe you gotta go outside of local. Everything we just talked about was all local. FRS, the family radio, Baofeng, this radio with a wire up, better antenna, but still just local, local line of sight. Well, now maybe I need to pull out the big wire antenna that you know, is 60 feet across and reach out even further and see if how widespread the issue is. Again, super hypothetical, doomsday stuff. But a lot of the times, this is just as simple as I'm out in the field and I don't have cell phone anymore. I mean, that's what this boils down to. And, and I think a lot of what you guys are all doing out here, right? So something to keep in mind. 
Do you need the full pace plan necessarily if you're going hiking? Probably not, but some may choose to. Okay, frequency planning. Let's take the, the easier example. You're on a hike, your cell phone, you don't have signal anymore, right? But people know you're out there. People know you're going to be hiking, and they are within VHF range. So maybe you have a GMRS radio, a 50-watt GMRS radio at home. You've had it set up in a place where it's easy to get to. Your significant other can get to it. It's set to channel whatever. There's a little piece of paper that says, I am hiking such and such place at this time. I will be monitoring channel six. Channel three is the emergency channel for GMRS, but I'll be monitoring some channel. Call me if you need me, and I'll check in around 6 p.m. tonight. There's your frequency plan. It can be as simple as that, but it can get more complicated in that maybe you have a group of like-minded individuals that all are within like, you know, uh, line of sight range. You all have Baofengs. I hope you have your license. Sub to my channel and you can learn how to get your license. But uh, you all have Baofengs and you program them all alike, right? And you have a plan. Maybe it's a three by five card or a laminated card you tape on the back that says in an emergency, we meet on Baofeng channel 2 or 145.400 megahertz. That's where we meet to talk, to communicate. Uh, if that channel is in use, and you'll experience this with, with family radios and GMRS radios, people can be on those frequencies, right? In an emergency in particular, you'll hear people just having chatter. They could be in distress, they could be upset. They could be on your primary frequency because you don't know what's going to happen. So you need to have contingency frequencies as well, probably listed on the radio. It says, if channel one's in use, go to channel three. Channel three's in use, go to four. Just take it all the way down until you get to a point where you can make communication. I recommend that you write this down. You send it, you email it, you text it to whomever it is you want to communicate with, and you laminate it on a card, and you keep it with the radio. Generally, I like to have the radio, the battery, the antenna that I plan on using, possibly one of these roll-up ones, and yes, this will work with this radio, and a means to charge this radio together in a waterproof box and the plan that I plan on using it. And by plan, I understand the plan, but maybe not everybody understands the plan or has drilled as much as I have with this stuff. So I want the capability to just grab a waterproof box, hand it to somebody, have a couple of them on hand to be able to hand them out. I will add, for everybody that does go outdoors properly outside a cell phone range, there is a protocol we use. It is called the Wilderness Protocol. So anyone that is a ham specifically, you can do this as well with GMRS. It's pretty simple, but the concept is every three hours, starting at 7 a.m., you monitor the chosen emergency frequency for five minutes. In GMRS and FRS case, that's channel three. In the amateur radio case, it is 146.520 megahertz. I'll say it again, 146.520 megahertz. The reason for this is, is we wanna conserve our most precious resource in, in battery, right? For our radios. When we're out hiking, we want it to last the entire time we're out. We're not just going to sit there playing FM and, and hanging out and chatting on it. We're going to use it as an emergency tool. So 7 a.m., you turn this thing on, and you can say, in my case as a ham, I would say, Kilo India 6, November Alpha Zulu, I'm monitoring 146.520 as part of wilderness protocol. If you need help or assistance, come back to me. And people that are hurt or in some kind of dire situation can come back at those specific times every three hours and you can be there in case it happens. Or vice versa, you need help. You stumble upon somebody, they're hurt, you get on this frequency at that right time and try and call for help. Did you have a question or was you just playing around? You were just playing around. The... Um, in some cases, I, I, California, I don't, I don't know how much of this happens out here, but California, we get a lot of people that get stuck off-roading or they, they are out hiking and they go way too far. I, I'm, I'm, 
I'm hesitant to say typical Californian. Goes out with not enough water and not enough gear, and it's too damn hot, and they get heat stroke. Uh, we've had multiple situations where people use ham radio, just like this, and have, have got onto a repeater, right, that this is talking to, and said, hey, who's on frequency that can help me? And there's someone else listening to that repeater. That person who's at home with cell phone or landline calls the first responders and tells them, we got somebody down up on a hill where there's no cell phone coverage. And that's kind of how emergency communications looks like a lot of the time. You're going to stumble onto somebody that needs help. So a lot of you are already carrying first aid kits. You're probably prepped on using tourniquets. You've got all that stuff. Well, what happens if you stumble on someone? You just put a tourniquet on them. You just wrote on Sharpie, when I put that tourniquet on, how do you call for help? Your cell phone's not working, right? So this is the, the next step of that. You move them? Is that does somebody saying you move them? Or is that just, I heard chatter? Anyway, you could move them, but I don't think we're supposed to do that. I don't know. I was always told not to move somebody if you got it, unless you're getting shot at or you're getting shot at. Uh, when transmitting, okay. The difference with, with just having fun with radio, you're, you're playing with your kids. They've got FRS radios that are running around. Everybody's screaming in this. They've got no discipline. They hold this thing down, and they're just running down the street. Um, that's not the case in emergency communication. You want to have people understand, and, and everybody drill this into the people you may potentially work with when you're talking about emergency communications. It needs to be pithy and to the point and stop transmitting. PTT down, I am here, I need this, let go. Or identify yourself. Kilo India 6, no member Alpha Zulu, monitoring for emergency traffic. Stop, and then listen. Lots of listening. Only reply if you can actually help. If you are also someone that is in the middle of nowhere with no cell phone coverage and someone says, I've got someone that's snake bit, we, we believe it's poisonous, and I've, I've immobilized them so that they're not going to move, I need help. We don't go, oh, what kind of snake was it? Can you tell me what color it was? No, don't, don't get involved. You can, however, if it's not on a repeater, again, something that's rebroadcasting for you, you can act as a relay. I don't have a map up in this case, but if, if they're 10 miles away and there's somebody at the zero mile point that has cell phone capability in their car with a better radio, and this person can't hear this person, but you can hear this person, or you may think there may be somebody out there and you're at the five mile part, then you can say, there is an emergency, we need help, is there anyone within range of my radio that could render aid? or pass the information on to first responders. That can happen too. That has happened. Now it gets a little dicey because now you're dealing with three-way traffic where you're passing on and back and forth. It's, it's kind of nuts. Uh, but anyway, keep it to the point. Keep it pithy. It should be life's on the line potentially. So you know, make it, make it count. All right, so advanced training. Uh, this is just, no, I take that back. Two of these are amateur radio related. The other two, anyone can get involved in. ARIES is Amateur Radio Emergency Service. It is uh, a group that was sponsored by the ARRL, which is the American Radio Relay League, which is one of the largest, governing bodies is the wrong term, but the largest representative body, representative group for amateur radio operators. They have an emergency group. Uh, they're all over the country. They're like a club, basically, that you join. They work with local events, local community events. They work with first responders. They drill with first responders. Good group. Department of Homeland Security also has a group. It's called RACES. You, if you're going to look this up, make sure you put DHS or Department of Homeland Security in front of it. Otherwise, you're going to get the next NASCAR race. OK? So you have to put those together. Otherwise, it's not going to make any sense. And then, and for everybody that was here yesterday, that's the same joke. Sorry, I don't have any new jokes for that one. So Skywarn is, uh, Skywarn is not necessarily radio related, but in, in places in the country where you actually get real weather, uh, Skywarn is fantastic. It's a really good training program that's very easy. It teaches people how to spot cloud patterns and weather patterns and, and make sure to pass that information on in an efficient way to hopefully also save lives. And then CERT, any, again, I think I asked CERT, no CERT. Anyway, Community Emergency Response Team. It's usually uh, city-based, coordinated by the sheriff or the fire department in your area. They have communication groups, but not all the time. Where am I at? 
All right, I'll, I'll jump through this kind of quick. This is some of my recommended gear, and I'm not mentioning brands or specific things like that because there's just too many. Uh, I'll mention some names that you can write them down. For FRS radios, um, I like Uniden. That is a black Uniden unit that you can almost not read, and Redivis. Okay, brands aside, I want everybody to consider two things. Again, the most vital resource of a radio is its battery. That's the thing it consumes. The antenna, vitally important, but you don't deplete the antenna when you're using it, the batteries. So for FRS and GMRS radios, FRS specifically, I like ones that take AAA cells and AA cells. And if they're rechargeable, that's fine, but they better have a USB port on it. I don't want something where I've got to drop it in a cradle because now that's one extra thing I have to pack with me, figure out how to charge it off of a solar panel or off of a battery bank. I like it where it's got a plug right on the side of it and I can go with that. That's my recommendation there. Yes? Redivis. It's actually right there. R-E-T-E-V-I-S. Redivis. This model in particular takes three AA batteries and has a micro USB plug on the side. The Uniden takes four AAAs, no USB plug. Now, I, I will um, also mention this. This is kind of important since we're here and we haven't got an image. Look, note the stubby antenna. Non-replaceable antenna. That's one of the realities of FRS. The FCC wants FRS radios to be close-in, family-related related comms. I'm at a theme park. I'm at a, a picnic. Put one on your kid. Um, kids love these, by the way, but um, regardless, that's what their goal is. Keep it close in comms. GMRS, it expands it a little bit by having replaceable antennas, so keep that in mind. These are the cheapest radios. They're the best to have on hand if you just need to hand them out to people. Again, you can tape a laminated card on here that says, we're monitoring emergency channel three, backup channel six, whatever. You literally can make up your own plan here. I'm just giving you ideas. GMRS has handhelds as well, but now you've got the bigger brother radios. Those are 50 watt output radios. They can go in your car. They have antennas that go on the roof. They're much better performers. Also, much more expensive. That is like a $300 radio about, I believe. Uh, GMRS repeaters do exist, but they are rare. It depends on which state which county you're in. Uh, back home in Southern California, we were, we're lousy with them. We've got them all over the place, but your mileage will vary. I don't know. All right, CB. Still is super useful. Uh, a lot of truckers still use it. You still hear them out there. I hear them all the time. I happen to be by a freeway at home. Limited power output. Again, it's licensed on the radio. Prices vary greatly. Um, if, you, if you know someone that knows CB, you can get hooked up pretty well, probably with a used radio. Probably done a little work to it, probably puts out more power, uh, and you can get a good antenna as well. Price varies highly, but generally on the low side. A um, couple of notes on this one. Generally, CB radios are non-handheld, they're mobile. They look just like this. Oh, you can barely see that, sorry for the brightness, but uh, they look like little mobile radios you'd shove in a dashboard or under a dash. They take 12 volt DC power. Right, so you're gonna have to have a power solution that is 12 volt DC to make them work. And they generally will require an external antenna. There are a couple of handhelds, but I wouldn't bother with those. I would not, the antennas are just too big at that frequency that they're operating on. Wouldn't, was, wouldn't mess with them. Okay, and then last is amateur radio. Uh, forget that white radio in the middle. Amateur radio is the widest coverage of all of them. You have Baofangs on the cheapest side, going all the way up to thousands, tens of thousands of dollars. It's the biggest like money hole hobby in the world, but for emergency communication, you don't need to worry with most of that stuff. Uh, there, are, there are a wealth of deep dive topics in this that I simply cannot cover in the hour or so that I have. If you are interested in more information in any of these topics, I literally have like a thousand videos on my YouTube channel that goes into greater detail into the specific aspects of it and fun little rabbit holes that, that give you all kinds of capability. I have some business cards up here that have a QR code on the back. Just point your camera at it um, and you can use that that way. So questions? 
I was only talking about non-service solutions. With that said, there is a wealth of satellite-based solutions. Um, Spot is one of them. It's a little orange hockey puck. It's got two buttons. I'm OK and SHTF. Those are the buttons. You, you, you push the button that says I'm OK and everything's fine. You push the other one when, they, when you literally want someone to come get you. It provides very little context of what the details are of the emergency. It's just like, oh shit. Uh, the Garmin inReach, I feel, is a better option. It looks like, really, it looks like a tiny little radio. It's like a stubby little one of these. It's got a tiny little screen. A lot of the backpackers use them that do long distance through hike backpacking. And you see them, they'll strap them onto their shoulder like this. These guys are nice because you can actually send messages through it using a cell phone app. So you can get a little bit more specific with the details. And that's great, it's not free. Those things are already pretty expensive on their own, plus you have to pay a service. The Spot is probably the cheapest, I believe it's $100. Dave's right there, Dave, Dave, question for you. Have you ever played around with the Garmin inReach? The Garmin inReach? Yeah. I know to tell you that it didn't work in Brazil. How much was the service? Back then it was like 70 bucks a month. Okay, for so. Full for full, okay, full on. So it, it varies, right? So keep that in mind. Now there are sat phones. Sat phones are great too, but you pay for that. Uh, they do have an interesting setup with sat phones. They, they still have rollover minutes on sat phones, which is kind of cool. So you get a real low tier sat phone plan and you kind of store them up for a little while. That could be useful for you, uh, depending. There, there, are, there are other options. Me personally, I do this. I keep it within radios under my control and within amateur radio personally. Uh, go, go knock on the repeater owner's door. What, what the heck, man? You don't have solar panels for this thing? Uh, good question, though, because a lot, at least out, out where I am, a lot of the, the repeater shacks, we've got them on the top of mountains, and the ownership of that is the forestry service. And you've got to play whatever rules they put down. And it could just be AC fed line. It might not allow for solar panels. With that said, I know a lot of them do have solar panels. What happens there though, when you're on full mains power, you're getting generally the, the, the repeater will put out its full power or whatever the repeater owner has set it to. When it fails over to solar, it generally will put out less power because it's probably running on a battery bank and they want to keep the repeater running as long as possible while still being able to recharge the battery throughout the day. So it can vary. Again, this is all case by case. What happens down in California for me is totally different than what happens out here. You guys have rain. I got clear skies and solar 24 seven, well not 24 seven, but you get the idea every day. Um, so a bit different. More, yeah. 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 Where do you think he heard about this stuff from? <laughs> All that ham radio stuff he's doing now is because of me. No, so this, um, this is, okay, this is really expensive. I don't think Dave told you how much, it, this is $450, okay? Not cheap. What this does, it's obviously solar. You can give it 12 volts to charge the internal battery. It is 18,000 milliamp hours. It has two USB ports that put out 4.5 volts at two and a half amps, maybe two amps. But it also has a 12 volt output. That 12 volt output will run this radio because it provides three amps on 12 volts and will run that. And the advantage of using this with this radio is this radio likes it when you give it an external 12 volt source. It'll take it from five watt output to 10 watt output which is exactly what I do. I actually roll this up and I plug the 12 volt line into it. Yeah, it's, it's such a, in the ham radio world, we call this a flex. <laughs> Go ahead. And continuous until the battery dies. <laughs> it's a, there's a battery inside. So it, now, $450 seems like a lot, but it's three things, really. It, four things, really. It's a panel, charge controller, and a battery. If you added all that up, you're pretty close to that already. It's not a big battery, it's not a big panel, but if you're doing lightweight radio stuff, it's fine. 
Depends on how fast you suck the juice out of it. it it's totally, I mean, you, you take, so, by the way, I have a video on this. This is longer than a, a quick thing. What you have to do is you take the milliamp hour rating of the battery, and then you take the draw in amps of the radio in transmit and receive. And you have to consider how often am I going to transmit versus just receiving. Ideally, you listen a lot more than you transmit. So let's say 40% transmit, 60% listen. So you take that number and you factor it against the 18,000 milliamp hours or 18 amp hours, and it'll give you a straight line of how long you can run. Then you factor in how much the solar panel is putting back into the battery and how much daylight you can expect, and that gives you a rough idea. I definitely can't just do that off the top of my head for you. You need a spreadsheet. <laughs> the panel? Power film solar. Power film, all one word, solar. The smaller one. It will charge your phone, but it won't charge the radio. That's the difference. Yeah, they work. So yeah, if you're not, if you're not gonna monk around with, so if you don't need a 12 uh, volt source, for like a radio, and you're just gonna use USB to charge your radios, the smaller one's okay. Not a lot of capacity though, so keep that in mind. In some cases, you're better off with just a big honking battery bank that'll last you a week than something that's like, I gotta depend on the sun and a smaller battery. Questions? What'd I do? I, sped, I, I made it faster this time. I got through the slides faster on the second day. Say again? Most of the people I know who use CG or 11 meter radio. Yeah. Frequency band. Enhances their signal strength. And they enhance their power. You have a thousand miles down the stairs, like you're talking about. Now, and I, and I, have, and some guys I know are on the radio all the time with thousands and thousands of watts. And I know you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Because it's clear as a bell. Yeah. And sometimes you can speak to, I spoke to a guy in a, a Milwaukee one day. Yep. He thought I was in the driveway. Yeah. It, I mean, it does happen. Mm -hmm. But now, you said five watts, I mean, what you said, the way the radio's coming. Yeah. Yeah. Now, as far as you know, is the FCC looking down the 11 meter band? No. That's what I hear. No. But a, a couple of points there I want to mention. Um, so one, ham radio upper limit on power is 1,500 watts. But carrying that equipment in your backpack's not really feasible. Uh, two, CB's great, but, let me go back. Okay, CB is great, right? We're talking 11, 11 meters is what we say the band is, but it's like what, 26, 27 megahertz around there? Yeah. So. I'm trying to make this as like pithy and to the point. Emergency communication style. How often do you talk to Milwaukee? I don't try to. Okay. I'm looking for about 100 miles. Right. Are you doing that often? 100 miles? Yeah. Like to the same person every day? Or different people, depending on who's on. Just random? Right. Okay. That's kind of the point I want to make is that there's a level of randomness to hobbyist radio users like myself and, and you. We, we're just calling out like, hey, who's out there? Let's chat. A lot of what we're talking about today is radio with the intention of talking to specific people. And I want it to be reliable and I want it to work almost every time. And that's where you're going through that pace plan, right? If the primary can't make me get to that person I want to talk to, alternate. If that doesn't work, contingent. If that doesn't work, emergency. I also sit at home and dink around and try to talk to whoever I can get to, but I'm not also saying, hey, could you help me out? Uh, I need like five gallons of gas for my generator, right? Different concept. Um, but yes, I hear you. Now, for amateur radio, remember, I've got spaces all along here and about, where are we at? This is weird. I'm looking at this wrong. Yeah, right, right here is uh, CB, right? 
you guys are all right here, right? So when it's daytime for me, the, radio, the frequency I'm normally on is about right here. And then as it starts getting dark out, I start sliding down. Because the thing to keep in mind, and we didn't go into this, this is a deeper dive thing. This goes beyond the hour for sure. Uh, the bands for radio waves, the frequencies for radio waves, change whether it's the day or night cycle. CB, not that great at night. Not that great at night. At night, though, you got to go lower frequency. You got to take that slinky and stretch it out and use those lower frequency bands. So five watts, not a lot, but I can get down on those low frequencies and, and get more reliable communication. That's the difference, you know, yeah. But, yeah. So my background is a little different than most of your normal people here. I've spent my life going to different areas in the, in the world that are basically free in the middle of or at the end of the pool. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So either civil war or they're being invaded in the United States is there right. influencing the sunlight. Like yeah. Thank you. The ham radio system that's out there, how susceptible is that to things like spoofing oh. that are really being affecting the other form of communication that yeah. This, this, is, this is the, uh, I, I, we, we've now transitioned into the high speed, low drag conversation to radio. Because um, you're, it's wide open. Anyone can do whatever they want. There's no encryption in amateur radio. You can't encrypt CB, you can't encrypt GMRS, you can't encrypt FRS, right? So anyone can be anyone they want, hypothetically. If you're looking for something like that, then you need a private FCC radio license. And then in that case, you can run nominal levels of encryption, but nothing that, nothing that strong. If you're looking for that kind of, I think that's, am I leading you a bit? Is that kind of where you're going? Yeah, I was just wondering if that capability was out there or even possible with the hand radio. It, it is and it isn't. And the way we sometimes do it is we use digital encoding of voice and data that keeps most people with Baofengs from hearing us, right? So this, this radio, for instance, can take my voice and digitize it. And when I'm talking over it, other people with the same radio can then decode the digitized voice and hear me normally. But this guy, it sounds like <laughs> like that. But anyone with that radio could hear you. So, but you pay, you're paying $25, $1,200. Or in the closest handheld, $650 that does that. So. Uh, there's a couple of reasons for digital modes. The, the first, uh, Motorola is a great radio manufacturer, great man radio manufacturer, makes some really good radios, first responder radios, cop radios, firefighters, you're talking thousands and thousands of dollars, right, for their radios. They came out with a system called Moto Turbo, which is a, a DMR based system, I believe. I'm sure YouTube will correct me if I post this video. They um, basically took TDMA style data encoding and used it over RF. Chinese manufacturers started creating chips that do that level of TDMA encoding. And they started producing tons of DMR radios. They're not nearly up to Motorola level of quality, but uh, they have been modified the, the system has been modified somewhat to support amateur radio operators and what we do. So it's, it's not the same system, but it's kind of loosely based on that. And the, the Chinese have really taken to producing those, and there's a ton of them on the market, generally from $150 to $350 for one of those radios. And then the Japanese manufacturers, which we have two of them here, Yesu and ICOM, they each have their own digital standard. Yesu System Fusion and ICOM has D-STARS. Same concept, but they don't play together. You need a box in the middle if you want them to interoperate. All right. Any other questions? Okay. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it.